Ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the final session of the day. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Carrie from Harper's Bazaar, who will be, who will be doing the questioning today, and someone who's come all the way from London, um, who isn't that well, but she's <laughs> braved the elements and everything to, to be here, and she's also had a very interesting last 12 months. I'm sure she wants to, wants to tell you all about it. Philippa Craddock. Uh, cool, so we'll just dive right in. I think before we go into like the nitty gritty of the royal wedding, tell us about you and you know, how did you start in florals and get here? Hi, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me in NYC. It's so awesome here. I was last here about 20 years ago. I was an au pair working for a family um, <laughs> and I absolutely loved my year that I spent just outside of New York. And it's, I'd forgotten about the buzz and the energy and the positivity. So I'm totally coming back soon. So thank you. You're very lucky to all live here. Um, my, um, <laughs> My story is, um, as a florist is a slightly unusual one um, in that I used to work in the city in London. Um, I, was, uh, I was in executive search, um, focusing on strategists. And um, I fell pregnant with my first child and I was totally going to go back to work again. But after this little bundle arrived, I just completely fell head over heels in love with him. And there was no way I could go back to work full time. But I needed to carry on working for financial reasons, but also just to keep myself sort of entertained. And um, I set up a plant gifting company. So the idea was, ironically, instead of cut flowers, people would send these beautifully potted plants. Um, however, that didn't quite go according to plan because people use these plants as table centers, specifically at weddings instead. And on the back of that, people then asked if I could put bridal flowers together. And I was like, no, I can't do that. I'm not a florist. <laughs> um, but I saw what other people were creating, the bridal flowers, and I just thought, I don't think this is very good. I reckon I can do a bit of a better job. Um, so I bought a bunch of flower books, a um, bunch of flowers. And at this point, I knew what a rose was. I knew what a tulip was. But kind of beyond that, my flower knowledge was, was pretty limited. And I played and I practiced. and. I realized that I love flowers and I love playing with them. I'd always been artistic, but this was kind of the first medium that I found that I really got and really understood. And that's kind of how the floristry business began. How do you describe your flower style? Um, I would say we are very English, very <coughs> country garden, um, wild, loose, natural. Um, I always, I remember at the beginning, um, never wanting to have a particular style and thinking that I was going to be able to create everything for anybody. And my first ever meeting with somebody from Condé Nast Brides magazine, um, she sort of said, okay, tell me, who are you? What's your style? And I, at that point, my answer was, oh, I can do anything. And I just saw her going, oh, and just kind of glazing over. And I realized at that time that I had We have to fantastic have... reputations, editor. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I still love her, but because of her I realized that you have to be true to yourself and you have to have one particular style and I still I guess it's just kind of what naturally you create but um, people often say they can recognize our designs I'm not sure if that's true but we just sort of create what we love and I'm lucky because I have an amazing team of florists and they sort of follow they've, they've come to me so because of the style so naturally we tend to create similar designs so now down to like the big question how did on earth did you meet Prince Harry and Meghan Markle? How did you how did you land that job? Um, so we got a phone call saying, "Hi, we're calling from Kensington Palace. Would you like to come in and talk about the wedding flowers in May?" We're like, "Yeah, all right. <laughs> Why not? I check the diary." Um, so yeah, no, of course I'm I'm, I'm being silly. Yeah, we, we of course we're absolutely thrilled and, and delighted and, and sort of ran in there like a shot. So yeah, it was great. So it was very clear from the beginning that they weren't like they had chosen you off the bat. Um, no, I think they'd met with a number of different florists. I, I don't know how many they did um, meet with, mm -hmm. but I just remember the very first meeting. It was it was a unique meeting in that um, often when we meet brides and grooms, um, you sort of go in with no preconceived ideas. Um, you often don't really know them at all. Um, not that I knew the couple beforehand, but obviously I had a, an idea of who they were. 
um, not wanting to be so presumptuous to assume I knew who they mm -hmm. were. Um, but it was, it was unique in that I, I already came with some ideas um, to the meeting, unlike, unlike most meetings, but obviously you just wait and hear what the bride and grooms have to say. What was the planning process like for that wedding and how does it, would you see differ from your normal process? Um, I would say it was really similar, really similar process. Um, just required a few more security checks to get into the meetings, <laughs> that was all. But it was, it was, it was very, very similar. Um, in the, the meeting was, the first meetings were incredibly relaxed, they were very down to earth. Um, it was me getting to know them very much as a couple, understanding what they were wanting to create, um, and really sort of getting their personalities and making sure that that was brought out in the flowers, exactly as we would do with any bride and groom. What are the key differences? I think it's interesting from our perspective because it's an American bride, but what are the key differences? You said your style is very British. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? And is there anything from that planning process that an American bride could apply? I think, so in terms of um, us, so going back to our style, mm -hmm. so if you imagine an English country garden, I would say that's very much our style, so full of hollyhocks and foxgloves and garden roses, that real romance and femininity um, in the designs. And for me, that is the absolute sort of the, the sort of key thing to weddings and of course that's why we're appointed for those kind of weddings it's when a bride wants that kind of style so we're not brilliant at doing very compact dome designs which look breathtaking and beautiful in their own right but we're much more about creating sort of natural designs um, I think it's also really important to work with the structure of the buildings so looking at the architecture and making sure that you're working with the lines and the feelings and the tones and the mood as well for the event. So I think that's really important too. How many site visits, because I feel like for florals especially, like site visits mm. when you're transforming a space or everything, mm. how did you manage that, especially in a space that's such a landmark historic space? Uh, for this, specifically yeah. for the Royal Wedding. Um, and also how you do it for other weddings. Yeah, I think it's, um, Sometimes it can be done through photography. Um, if the venue is, is far away, we do a lot of overseas events, so it, it's not, we can't necessarily always get to the venues. Uh, but normally it's just one site visit is, is ample to be able to get an idea. I think, well, for me, it, you, get a, you get a sense as soon as you walk into a space of what's needed in that room. Um, and that's why we're appointed by brides and groups, so we can bring that. And it's, it's always, it's, it's one of those things, I think, it, to me, it comes very, very easily, just instantly. This is what's needed in the room um, with our style point of view. And also, obviously, depending on what the clients want. Who is your bride? Like, if you had to describe her. <laughs> and not say Meghan Markle. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're really lucky. All our brides, and I genuinely mean this, all our brides are absolutely gorgeous. Um, I am down to earth. I hope that comes across. My team are absolutely gorgeous. I only ever employ lovely people. It's one of the most important things. I have to work with these people on a daily basis. Um, just to clarify, you, you mean like on the inside? Also. <laughs> on the inside? Yeah, just, oh yeah, no, no, do you mean... Because in, no, in the US, no. like we typically use gorgeous only for... But oh like, that's goodness. like nice too, but just yeah, clarify. Yeah. So on my team, I only employ beautiful people. <laughs> oh goodness, that sounds so bad. No, on the inside, yeah, absolutely. They all happen to be beautiful as well. Um, but yeah, and I, th I think that sort of generally attracts. I think whatever your brand is and what you put out there is exactly what you bring back. Um, I think also our brides are, they're not necessarily always want to be the center of attention. Um, I think that's one of the key things for us as well. It's quite often we have brides and grooms that come to us saying that we want to create this incredible day for our friends and our family. We want them to feel brilliant. We want them to feel safe. Now, I think that's a really interesting word when it comes to event designing is when I'm creating a space, I want people to feel really safe in that area so they can let their hair down and they can have fun. So often things like dance floors, we do incredible installations over dance floors to make it feel really intimate. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a, it tends to be quite a giving person, a kind person, and normally quite feminine as well. I think our designs are quite girly, which I love. And when a bride comes to meet with you, can you just walk us through what the process is like? So mm -hmm. I inquire with you and then what happens? 
So somebody will um, either call or by email and um, we'll have an initial conversation with them. We will then, because everybody wants things really quick, so we will then go, go back probably just within a few hours with just top line ideas, a rough idea over costs and what things will, will, what things will come to and, and how, the, how the process works. If they then want to then meet with us, um, we then have a full consultation and that can take up to a couple of hours. And then after that stage, we then come back with a full design proposal. And that includes descriptive copy, but also a lot of imagery and sketches. Um, we do a lot of work where we create designs um, on top of um, the, sort of the venues. So you get a really good idea of what, what the designs are. Like four renderings. Like. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that's a really, really important part, particularly when you're talking about big installations. Um, yeah. And in terms, you mentioned that you first kind of budget is sort of where you lead. Mm. Do you, is there a minimum that a bride needs to kind of come to the table with in order to work with you? And what is that minimum and what should a bride expect? I think in terms yeah. of budget percentage, not even to work with you, but I think that yeah. as an editor, I see there's a large misconception of what yeah. flowers cost. Yeah. So I think, I think that's one of the toughest things definitely sure. is, the, is the perception over the value of flowers. Um, they are incredibly expensive um, in terms of the flower itself, but also the amount of work that needs to go into them. Um, so we would only would only ever work on design proposal if somebody already had a budget in place. We would never do otherwise. In terms of minimum, we don't we don't set a particular minimum, um, and I don't ever want to do that. I think it's I think that's really wrong process to start doing that. Excuse me. <coughs> I was hoping I wasn't going to cough. I'm sorry. Um, You're human. So. Now we all know. <laughs> we <love it. coughs> Thank you. Um, so I think though, and the budgets again, um, they sort of range. I suppose are smallest. And I think the flares in the UK they're not as expensive as in the US. Um, but we start probably from about five thousand, and that's going to give you some small designs. But then we go up to hundreds and hundreds of thousands so it just yeah depends on the installation pieces do you have any tips in regard to maximizing a budget like things mm. like seasonality or yeah using local product like is there yeah. anything that you recommend to maximize even the smallest budget yeah definitely seasonality absolutely um that's key because obviously the flower prices are much less and the digital is so much better as well um, and then foliage just go crazy crazy with greenery but don't cut from the garden. I think it's, there was one way, 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 way back for a friend, thank goodness. Um, I made the mistake of using loads of greenery for an event she had, my goodness. The whole thing died. It was then up quick, changing absolutely everything. So it was great, unfortunately, to learn on a friend, but it was, it was one of those things. So I think you have to source from a, a particular wholesaler, but, but absolutely, any, any foliage is a really good way of expanding the designs for less. In terms of the color palette for the royal wedding, did the bride and the groom have a specific idea of what they wanted or did you sort of build it with them and then just your tips and tricks to working with color? Mm. Um, that was really straightforward. Um, I felt that it should be quite a neutral palette, so pretty much whites and greens. Um, so did they. So that was easy. <laughs> Job done from that side. Um, and then in terms of color palettes, I think, oh my goodness, sometimes go crazy. Don't do the same as everybody else. And I think I had a really good conversation with somebody just before this, and they were talking about how flowers can be really personalized. And I think that is the most important thing. Totally get inspiration from magazines and, and sort of other people's weddings. But they've got to feel, they've got to be important to you. And whether it's a particular color or whether it's a particular flower, because if your grandmother loved that particular flower I think you always want to personalize things very important and in terms of you just mentioned don't do the same thing as everybody else mm. what's one thing that you could you don't ever have to see again like is there a trend in mm. flowers or a, or just even something that you'd like to be reinvented because you've seen it so much it changes oh my goodness um, I think red and white combined together I don't like red and white together <laughs> and often um, 
you know, I sort of let brides and grooms sort of have their have their sort of freedom and, and what they want to create, and it's always really exciting to come with different ideas. But if somebody ever comes with red and white, it's like no, <laughs> don't do that. It's like it's like that sort of barber's pole, isn't it? The sort of blood and bandages. So that's what it reminds me of. <laughs> What are some key mistakes that you see brides making in the planning process that you kind of just would love to tell these people so that they avoid them up front? Oh, um, getting stressed. I think there was, um, I had, it was a good few years ago, I had the most gorgeous meeting with a bride and her mother and father. And her father said, you know what, this is so much money, but it's worth every single penny because we are so enjoying the process. So he didn't see that big sum as being sort of put towards that event. It was the whole planning process. And I think that's really important. And I think the practicality is going back to what you were saying before is the sort of the misconception over the price of things. Budget really, really carefully. Um, but also remember it's your it's that one day. So Go as crazy as you can do, but don't go completely nuts. Um, it's heartbreaking if we meet if we meet couples, and they just to say my budget is X, and you just you get a sense how stressed they are because they're really stretching themselves. We will always step in and say no, listen, just let's just chill, let's bring everything back, and let's keep it much more sensible. And in terms of choosing a florist, yes, I think that you mentioned the way that you work with a bride is that it's meetings, 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 tons of renderings. Yes. Like, are there red flags that brides should look out for or things that a florist should ask you in the lead up that if people are glossing over, it might just be a little bit, a little thing for you to note? I think in terms of rather than things that they may be glossing over, it's more, um, it's more the chemistry and just the connection that you have with that particular supplier. I think particularly well, as, a, as a planner, obviously planners become incredibly close to their couples, um, but florists very much as well. Um, so I think it's that you just get a sense, you know if this person is going to be the right person for you, you know if they feel honest. Um, and I think one of the, one of the other things um, that sort of in the early days, quite often, um, if somebody's asking what your budget is, it's not because they're trying to catch you out and charge you extra. It's a really, really valid question. And in fact, I would be concerned if a florist didn't ask somebody what their budget was. Um, once you know that, you then work within that parameters rather than going crazy. Maybe that. Love that. Um, and in terms of, I'm trying to work around what I know that you're probably not allowed to answer in regards to the royal wedding. Um, but in terms of how you translated what we saw at Windsor Castle yeah. to the other, so kind of channeling from one space to the next to the next, like how do you figure out the transition of space? Is it a totally different experience or is it like, does one space inform another? Um, so I think you sort of, you always, in my mind, I always have that client, um, that couple in my mind, um, and then it's sort of walking through the spaces and how they talk to me, if that makes sense. Um, and I think sort of specifically talking about the role wedding designs, it was wanting originally to bring, it was, it's such an austere building, Windsor Castle, the, the chapel, St. George's Chapel. Um, I was laughing about that earlier, the fact it's called a chapel, it's not a chapel, it's a freaking cathedral, it's massive this thing. Um, but it was that whole softening. And then I wanted to make sure that particular design then continued through. But I also at no point wanted just to shove a design somewhere for the sake of it. It had to work and it had to flow. And I think particularly in that chapel, again, it has very key spaces. So you've got the entrance, which is one very key space where a lot of photography, photography was going to be taken. And then you've got the, the two separate parts of the chapel, the very first bit as you sort of walk, walk down the island, if you remember seeing all the, the sort of, there was five little archways, they weren't little, they were quite big. And then to the actual ceremony itself. And at that stage, I wanted to pair or bring everything back and keep it really simple. So we just had two urns um, there. So again, yeah, it's, it's sort of making sure the whole design flows, but it works with the structure as well. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of American brides, there's a bit of a myth that you can repurpose flowers that yeah. you can like, okay, you take your urn from your ceremony and you yeah. move it into your cocktail hour yeah. and it's like easy. Yeah. Um, it's a myth for a reason. Um, <laughs> but can you kind of just 
Is it at all possible to repurpose blooms? To some extent, yes, but it can be a nightmare as well. I think um, you just have to, it's just, the amount of times we've asked, okay, can you, yeah, exactly, can you just carry this urn from this way, uh, this, this place This 500 this pound urn. Yeah. 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 Which actually, logistically, you can, you can, with enough people, you can pick it up. It's just, imagine if you're having a drinks party and you just see like six really muscly guys carrying an urn through the drinks party to the next place. It just looks ridiculous. Um, so I think sometimes sort of bring that idea back. But I think it is good if you, I mean, if you can repurpose, we're always encouraged to do that. Um, the, the flowers at the end of the event can be turned into bouquets, but with a massive warning in that those flowers have been made sure that they look perfect on that day. So they've got like a day or two days lifespan after that. So that's something to sort of bear in mind as well. But yeah, the moving of, of structures sometimes, but yeah, not so much. But it's interesting, the planners in the room, I could hear them sort of mustering going, no. Yeah, nodding. <laughs> Is that something you're all asked quite a lot? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think for like the planners and other yeah. business people in the room, how has your business changed since, since you've done the Royal Wedding? Uh, um, I think I'd, I'd be silly to say that it hadn't. Um, of course it has. I mean, it was it's an incredible gig to get and suddenly we had global recognition. Prior to that, we were working on some pretty big projects with some really exciting clients, but it definitely changed things. Um, it's a kind of, I think, these kind of things are yin and yang in that it comes with, with positives, but there's also negatives. Um, the press intrusion, not you guys, different press intrusion, um, was at a whole extraordinary level. And it's just trying to balance that. Um, I personally preferred it when nobody knew. <laughs> and I kind of wish it remained that way to some extent. Um, but suddenly having your face sort of plastered over newspapers just for a couple of days was a bit of a surreal feeling. Um, but we're trying to sort of harness that and turn it into real positive things. Um, I'm, there's one of the things I'm probably the most proud about is um, I become a patron for one of the Prince's Trust charities. And that means everything to me. And I think to be given an opportunity like we were given in May, I have to give something back. It is, it's got to be balanced. Um, so we're now working, um, helping um, disadvantaged young women um, who are in really, really tough places. And they range from sort of 16 to 23 years old. And it's about getting them back into society, back into education, into employment. Um, and the, wow. this particular charity runs an incredible um, ability to be able to do that. So it's those kind of things I think I'm probably the most proud and the most excited about. Um, and just because, yeah, my name now can be put to some good, which is, which is awesome. That's what we all want. Kind of leads into my next question, but sort of, do you have any other projects outside of Wedding Flowers that you're excited about or that yeah. you feel like people should know about or that you've taken on since the Royal Wedding? Yeah, yeah. There's, um, yeah, there's been some really fun projects. Um, I'm also, I'm, I'm, I constantly need to be busy. I need loads of different things going on at any one time, so it's great from that side. Um, we've got a series of products coming out, which I am unbelievably excited about. Um, we're launching, um, it's all a little bit secret, but it's gonna be happening in the next month, but we're launching a big set of new products for Selfridges in London. And I've got a meeting on Tuesday with a big department store in New York um, to launch over here, which is awesome, so I'll get to come back again. And um, I'm meeting with, this sounds so cool, I'm meeting with my new New York literary agent on Tuesday as well <laughs> to write a book. Um, so there's awesome. a bunch of things like that that's, that's kind of cool. So yeah. It's exciting. Yeah, it's fun. I'm going to turn it over to everyone else because I'm sure everyone has questions for you that I didn't quite get to. But does anyone have any questions? Did I get through everything? Yes? Um, so I'm getting married in March. Oh, congratulations. Oh, okay. nice. <laughs> It's like, I wow. Know, I don't see them March. It's like, especially in like New Jersey area, New York is like not fabulous. Mm. Any like suggestions that like different, fla like, you know, for seasonal flowers, stuff like that? So I think the climate is not too dissimilar um, oh, to the UK. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's a really cool time of year to get married. Um, you definitely want to go for all the different spring flowers. Ranunculus are just the most beautiful, beautiful flowers, like mini peonies. Um, and then all the stunning narcissi, all the mini daffodils. Um, but yeah, there's, there's heaps, but all the, it's like the late spring flowers. And I would keep it, um, I would definitely sort of keep it to neutral colors. You're not gonna get 
too many big yeah. vibrant colors but just go simple but also don't um, don't think it don't sort of dismiss plants there's some really cute bulbs that you could use um, down table centers if you have little potted particularly things like the narcissi um, and hyacinths although they are heavily fragrant and people may end up sneezing because of those but you could do pots and pots of those keep it really simple and then they're really cute gifts for people at the end or you can plant them in your garden and they'll pop up year after year so yeah do that's a great great time to get married okay. <laughs> yeah Hello. Um, there's, a, there's a great number of, of garden rose varieties, uh, and you work with a lot of them, obviously, but do you have a particular favourite one? Uh, do you work in garden roses? I might. <laughs> Are you from Tambuzi? I might be. <laughs> All of those flowers. <laughs> um, no, but, but seriously, actually, um, there's, um, I, I knew you were coming. I'm so thrilled you're here. Hello. Um, I think the, the flowers from Tambuzi um, is an incredible flower farm in Kenya. I'm right, aren't I? And um, they grow some of the most stunning garden flowers you have ever seen in terms of the fragrance. Um, and the look of them, they are absolutely the typical sort of English country garden. So yeah, hand, hands down. There you go. What a plug. Thank you. <laughs> but it's, it's important. <laughs> Anyone else? I actually have a question for you, like yeah. to that note. Like, how do you go about sourcing flowers in terms of, and what should brides be prepared for in terms of, I mean, Kenya, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, there's like you can get peonies in like New Zealand and Alaska mm -hmm. at random times of year because I think sure. also, like, if you could speak a little bit to the key wedding flowers that all brides are obsessed with. Like, if I yeah. hear about peonies yeah. one more time, but like yeah. the seasonality of those of the yeah. more popular flowers would be. Helpful. So, ask me the question again. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> what what season yeah. is the best season for the most popular flowers, and where do you get them from? Got you. Um, summer. And again, it is definitely going to be the peonies and, and again, the garden roses. But, but having said that, I mean, we, we try and source locally as much as possible. Um, but when we can't, when it's out of season, we always use fair trade farms. That's really, really important. Another plug again for Tambuzi, <laughs> exactly that. Um, and it's making sure that, um, it's, I'm, I'm slightly sort of skirting the subject and, and what you said, but it's, it's really important that the workers there are all paid fairly, they're looked after really, really well. So you don't have to be so fixated on um, sourcing locally. You can absolutely source from overseas, but just be really, really careful where they're being sourced from. And any good florist should know what their supply chain is and where the flowers are coming from. I think that's really important. But in terms of season, yeah, summer. Summer is early. I don't know, actually, you know what? I probably, I think probably actually back in May, that's probably my favorite, favorite type of flowers, all those slightly garden meadowy flowers. Right, just thought I would bring. Oh, yes, back there. I I find that no matter how prepared you are, florist, vendor, every yeah. vendors, that morning of preparing that go to this wedding. Yeah. Were you at the last second doing little things? Because I feel like I'm never. No matter what, it could be perfect, and I'm still. <laughs> Like, what was it like that morning? Time to start. Like, <laughs> 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 you not go to sleep. Oh. Because that morning, the day of, yeah. until the flowers arrive, it's really not dressed to me. Yeah. Flowers arrive, then it's dressed. It's done. It's done. Well, so, I'm just curious. Do you come in stages? Did, it, did you, do you arrive that morning? I'm just, I'm just curious. Tell us everything. Yeah, it, it totally depends on the venue. Um, so I'm going to direct contrast. So actually for the royal wedding, um, because we had the complete unique situation in that the whole, the whole place was shut down a week beforehand, we are never given a week to set up. My goodness, that is just amazing. So we were like, oh my goodness, let's come in on the Tuesday. Wow, what are we going to do with ourselves at this time? So we just did it in stages. Um, there was a few sort of security measures as well that we had to sort of bring into place. And I'm really glad we started early because there were a couple of things that were sprung on us last minute where we just had to vacate the whole area. Um, so I'm really glad we had that time. 
But so that was, we kind of filled the time from the Tuesday through to um, the wedding on the Friday. But right the way through to, we do a lot of work at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And probably the same as some of the venues here, that we have an hour to turn around. And we have to, that one, wow. I love that. That's an adrenaline, it's just really exciting. And um, we, and it's a massive space, the V&A. I, I don't know if you know it, but it's, it's huge, huge, one of the biggest venues in London. And um, with, with the right team, with everybody being super organized, it's incredible how you can turn it into sort of winter wonderlands. But I'm sure like you, you have every single thing timed down to the last second. So you know exactly how long it's going to take to walk from there to there and everybody's in different teams. And it's, yeah, it's super organized. I love that. It's really fun. Um, yeah. As long as the queen approved, right? <laughs> yeah, I think she did. I heard. Yeah. I don't know. I never asked her. <laughs> well, we were all glued to our TV sets, Aww. but we never we saw the ceremony, but we never had the chance to see the reception. So can you tell us a little bit about no. the flowers? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. Oh, okay. I think it's, but I think it's, I think sort of like um, for a lot of couples, there are going to be elements of the day where it's really private, and I love the fact that there's a big, there's a big public um, bid, and it was it was big and giving, and then and there's obviously a private element right, right. as well. I, I respect but, yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite wedding flower? You personally. Oh my goodness, it changes the whole time, like constantly. Um, I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> it's probably, it depends what, um, again, what time of year, and I think um, the venue and who the people are. I love, um, I love simple April meadow flowers. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, is that when, April, is that when, again, the roses, they start, they start blooming there? I love... Um, you know better, I hope. <laughs> But I think, um, again, little delicate meadow flowers, I think, think they're so beautiful. There's a particular flower called an Aurelia, which is just stunning, and it, it's grown locally um, to us. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a beautiful little delicate white flower. I love that, just because it's different as well. Yeah? Um, I'm a florist in New York, and um, I think that there's, uh, you tend to use no oasis. Yeah. And, you know, when, like, how do you decide? How did you get to that place? Uh, this is a very technical question. Right? Yeah, yeah. This is a big debate in the floral right. world right yeah, now, yeah. right? Because, you know, it's, it's a lot of waste. Yeah. Um, plastic waste, essentially. Yeah. So, and I know that you're, you know, you have, I, I feel like you from Instagram, that you have sort of a bent of, in that direction. And I was wondering, sort of, what's the story, I guess, yeah. the question there? Well, I, I think like a lot of florists, I hadn't realized, um, I'll explain to people that don't, don't understand, um, there's um, a substance called floral foam or oasis, which is green bricks, and you soak them in water, um, and it makes flower arranging dead simple. Um, but also, nobody really knows the, the damage in terms of the pollutants. When you, when you cut this stuff up, the stuff that you're inhaling, it, it, it sort of smells pretty toxic. But also, it doesn't, um, it doesn't um, try and use the, the right word. But it's, it's not a, biodegradable. Thank it's you. not natural. Exactly, yeah. So it just it ends up in landfills. Um, but I, but uh, yeah, and it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty grim stuff. Um, but I, I did, I used to use it not not sort of realizing and then beginning to understand actually how bad this stuff is um because i sort of dutifully i recycle and all of those kind of things but yet we were using blocks and blocks of this stuff and then realizing how bad it was and then just just simply scrapping it from being able to from using it and you, i think it's just common sense you just kind of have to come up with ways and mechanics to be able to combat not using it um we obviously hadn't hadn't, hadn't previously done designs on the scale at windsor um castle before so again it's just trying to work it out and just sort of what yeah whatever makes sense it's kind of answers <laughs> Yeah. Um, I was in a men's restaurant earlier. Yeah. Flowers, right? <laughs> right. So I took a peek. There's like green blocks too, or it's the same ones. Or yeah, <laughs> it's that. But I, if the, if that florist is here, I would. I think the other thing as well, and I'm I feel really really strongly about this too, is that there is a big thing about not using um green oasis. 
but I don't think people should punish people that are, that are still using it. It's because they don't understand. Um, and I think that's cool, just that person doesn't quite understand how not to use it yet. Um, but I'd love to speak to them and I can come up with They're some here, ideas. They're here, I'll introduce ways. you. Oh, please, thank you. Um, it's also particularly challenging in installation work and ones that have to be alive for an incredibly long period of time. Like what's super popular right now, especially for giftings, is like those roses that last a year that come to your house. Like, that's literally just a block of Oasis being delivered to your house. So there's a lot of kind of back and forth of things that last a long time versus, you know, I think that that's. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm getting married somewhere to you in uh, oh. September of 2020. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> what timeline would you put out for a bride to start talking with the florist to determine their vision and make sure everything's ex executed properly? So. I'm probably the worst person to ask. I'm the most last minute person ever. Um, so I love it when somebody comes to me and says, I have a wedding in two weeks. Can you help? Yes, love it, love it. Um, I think whatever feel co feels comfortable for you. I think the most important thing is not so much the timeline, is making sure that you have the venue in your dress. So get those two first, and once you, once you have both of those, then, then it's the right time to start talking about your flowers. Perfect, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. Just going out with another florist, so going back to um, fair trade farms, how do you really follow in that trail to find out? We, don't, we know the countries are a lot of things. Come yeah. From, but not, and some of the farms we do see from South America, we'll see in time, but it's kind of hard to follow that. And I don't know how truthful my answers would be if I were to ask. <laughs> to um, we, know, um, we know where all our flowers come from. I think it's just asking. Um, I can I can trace back to all the the farms and I, I know I know those farms as well so I think it's just a case of research and speaking and, and asking and I think people are, are really honest um, we've got some amazing buyers based in um, Holland as well who have great relationships with some of the farms that we don't know so well and they'll know exactly which ones that we want to work with and, and don't want to work with but just just ask yeah cool I feel like we actually, oh, did someone else oh, raise their hand? Oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Do you actually go, do you still go to the flower market? Yeah. This was one of the problems when I started as a, as a florist. I'm not, I'm not necessarily a morning person. So, no, I don't, I don't tend to. Um, I think, again, working directly with the farms and working with buyers, um, they know, I know specifically the flowers that I want and, and they'll, they'll then select and, and deliver them. I love being spot on with time, and we are, <laughs> which is great. But thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.